look at the United States. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office's estimates for debt to GDP, debt to GDP is going to go like a straight line up from the pandemic to nearly 40 to 50 percent higher in terms of debt to GDP over the next 20, 30, 40 years. By the time we get to the year 2050, U.S. debt to GDP is going to be around 200 percent. So this debt around the pandemic that we're talking about is a drop in the ocean compared to what aging is going to bring to us. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary people from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Kevin Coldine, to host a series of in-depth conversations to help uncover and explain new ideas to make you a better investor. In the series, Kevin will be speaking to authors of new books and research papers to better understand the global economy and the dynamics that shape it so that we can all successfully navigate the challenges within it. And with that, please welcome Kevin Coldiron. All right. Uh, thank you, Niels. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're really fortunate today to have with us uh, Manoj Pradhan, who is the co-author of a very important book called The Great Demographic Reversal, Aging Societies, Waning Inequality, and an Inflation Revival. Why is this an important book? It's an important book because it deals with the structural forces that are going to drive markets over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. And to me, structural forces are something that we as investors can actually do something about, right? Um, so, we're going to talk a lot about inflation. We're going to talk a lot about interest rates and why both those things are likely to be much higher in the future than we've seen in the past. Um, so with that somewhat long-winded uh, introduction and, and, and sales pitch, uh, Manoj, uh, welcome to the show. Well, Kevin, thanks very much for having me here. That, that, that was a much better introduction than I could have done myself. So um, thanks. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad you found the book uh, useful um, it's 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 really been a pleasure, and all of the conversations we've had uh, in the wake of the controversies that we've seen over the last couple of years have been fantastic as well. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, no, that I, we're, I'm really excited about it, and um, you know, it, maybe if you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about your story. You know, your professional background, how you met uh, Charles Goodhart, who's a very well known uh, economist, and why you two decided to to write this book. Oh, with pleasure. Um, so Charles and I met when uh, uh, we were both at Morgan Stanley. Charles was uh, an advisor over there for, for a while, and uh, I was uh, in the economics department where I led the global economics team. And I think we were, we were very much in the minority during the time of lower for longer, and this is never going to change, and we're all doomed in Japan. Um, this, this was a time when both Charles and I thought that some of the longest structural stories which we both had a tendency to pay more attention to simply did not reflect um, glacial changes that nevertheless had very, very large impacts. And the conversation moved from obviously, well, what does what are the lessons from Japan? What can we learn from there? Uh, when the turn of demography comes and China turns, what will the impact on the global economy be? And where central banks would find it reasonable to respond and where not? And out of that came uh, a paper at Morgan Stanley uh, out of that came a presentation at the BIS's uh, annual conference, um, and we decided to extend the thesis to a book by doing a lot more work, make it a lot more rounded. Um, but at all those points in time, we really did not know when inflation would show up. In fact, uh, 
most of the book was written in 2019. And, you know, by the time the pandemic hit, we we still did not know when inflation would show up. But when it did hit, we were fairly confident that a acceleration of the things that we thought would happen over a five, 10 year period would occur because of the pandemic. And one of the things that we've liked um, about our, our prognosis, which was that post pandemic, we'd see inflation between five and 10% is how tight labor markets are. In the, in the early days, there was a huge discussion about scarring in the labor markets that would keep wage growth subdued. But, but we feel fairly vindicated by looking at the tightness of labor markets, looking at the shortages of labor. Um, and that's been the story that we've tried to talk about uh, and acceleration about. So it's, it's, it's been a fantastic ride. Sitting with Charles uh, is, is like being in a classroom every day and, and learning. And, <laughs> you know, I, I sometimes tell him that actually he's exactly the wrong person to write this book because if everyone <laughs> at his age worked half as hard as he, he does, we would have no demographic shortage. <laughs> right. Thankfully so for he's our a thesis, counter argument to your, uh, to your thesis. Really that, uh, but, but, but thankfully <laughs> for our thesis, not everyone is Charles. <laughs> you know? yeah, right, exactly. I'm definitely not going to be Charles. I'm going to be spending much more time on the tennis court and a golf course when I, when I get to his age. Um, so were you, you know, your book came out, uh, it, I think the summer of 2021 and, um, it really got a lot of attention, so much so that I actually wrote an article in Forbes and I said, hey, you know, it looks like 2021 is turning into the summer of demography, you know, and I was kind of bitter about that because it's like, hey, the, the baby boomers get the summer of love and we're stuck with the <laughs> summer of demographics. But are, were you surprised at how, you know, like how sexy demographics is now, like how interested people were in your arguments? Um, I, 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 really, I really was a little bit, taken aback, I have to say, we have seen interest in demography. It's very difficult to get away from it because there are phrases like demography is destiny. People have seen the impact, mistaken as we thought it is, on Japan. Um, but really, I think what was lacking in uh, in the marketplace or in the academic literature, uh, first of all, in the textbooks, there's very, very little about the supply side shaping the future of growth, and certainly almost nothing about supply side shaping the future of inflation, where most textbooks will still tell you that the central bank controls the rate of inflation uh, almost perfectly, even though in in real life, uh, you know, and in the medium term, that's hard to do. So yes, I, I think we were surprised, but by the time the labor shortages became a lot more persistent, I could I could understand why the interest in demography was was as strong as it was. Okay. Well, okay, so let's let's get into that then. Let's talk about the structural forces that I mentioned at the beginning and if we can maybe take a step back and introduce the listeners to how those forces in your view have affected the world in the last 30 years. And let's start with Demography. You, you basically start the book by talking about demography and China as the two key structural forces. So maybe start with demography to explain how that's impacted kind of inflation and interest rates in the last couple of decades. Okay, well, let's take history first. I think that I think that's a very very okay. good place to start. As you mentioned in our book, there are only two national chapters, and none of them are on the U.S., the Euro area, or the U.K. or any of the advanced economies. One is on China, and as I hope we'll discuss later on, the others on Japan. Um, And China, we thought, was a game changer. So the introduction of China um, and its massive labor force really took place in stages. You know, the the real opening up of the economy started in 1979. And if you look at China's share of global trade, uh, the role of emerging markets in the global economy, the disinflationary measures that have uh, uh, been witnessed in the advanced economies, all of them seem to center around that area. But the real thrust of it was when China started entering the global manufacturing system. And that really happened in the biggest way possible uh, in the year 2000, when the U.S. Congress gave China the equivalent of most favored nation status. In fact, there's a lovely paper by two Federal Reserve economists, uh, which correlates with that story very well. It's called a uh, fantastic title as well, The Surprisingly Swift Decline of U.S. Manufacturing Employment. I mean, it says it all. <laughs> um, and what they show you uh, on a item-by-item basis using a database is that all of the products that were manufactured in the United States under a threat of tariff 
which were relatively low productivity stories, labor intensive stories, as soon as China was given most favored nation status, the production of all of those things moved into China. And later on, the same products were re-exported back into the United States. Um, and that's how we got a lot of this disinflation, um, China setting the equilibrium wage. But effectively, the bottom line, if you want to think about it, is that the introduction of China's labor force into the global economy, along with the baby boomers, reflected a 120% increase in the effective supply of labor. It's an astonishing labor supply shock. The only equivalent that we could think of was the Black Death, which went the other way and right. sadly killed 25% of the labor supply that was available. We've never seen anything like it before. We're very unlikely to see anything like it again. And so it was no surprise that the cost of labor globally started falling. Uh, the middle segment of uh, 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 the advanced economies, and particularly the United States, found it a great struggle to keep their incomes intact. So U.S. inequality went up and global inequality fell because the emerging market economy started catching up much faster with the advanced economies. The result was disinflation. Okay, so we, there's a there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but if I could maybe try to summarize, so basically what you're saying with China is as it kind of almost suddenly integrated into the global labor force, you had a huge increase in the supply of labor and that put downward pressure on on wage rates and then in the co- in the price of kind of manufactured goods talk a little bit more you 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 hinted at kind of demographic changes influencing that as well talk can you talk a little bit more about the you know how the how the demographic influences impacted the the supply of, of labor and inflation as well you, you, in the book you talk about the um um this kind of the relative ratio of you know, I think of them as cost centers to 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 workers. So you know, you talk about kids and and retired parents as being kind of inflationary, and um, you know, workers as being deflationary. Can you explain that concept a little bit. Absolutely, with 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 great pleasure. In fact, that's that's one of the most intuitive um, explanations of demography and inflation. So so broadly speaking, I think I think the, the, the forces just to peek a little back a little bit further into history and bring it into the into the future is you know economists and demographers refer to what we call the dependency ratio. And the dependency ratio is the ratio of the people who don't work, very young people and very old people, to the number of workers we have in the economy. But there's a critical difference between the young dependency ratio and the old dependency ratio. Any time we have more spending on the young, we can almost justify it by saying, look, these guys are going to join the labor force a little later on and they'll be able to pay for whatever they've consumed. That's not true for the elderly. Now, with that in mind, what changes is that the the increase in the dependency ratio that we're going to see in the next 30 years is going to be a succession to the decline in the dependency ratio that we saw for the last 30. So the last 30 years was a massive increase in workers, not only from China, but also from the baby boomers. Now, as these guys retire and as China's labor force becomes smaller, the delta of demography in the global economy is going to be dictated by older people. So the old dependency ratio is going to rise very, very, very rapidly. Now, what does that mean? Dependents and workers have a very different effect on inflation, right? So let's think of a dependence. Um, dependents don't work. They consume. And therefore, for a given set of goods and services, you're creating an inflationary impulse, but no ability to change the supply of goods. So the net effect right. is inflation. If I look at workers, workers are disinflationary for two reasons. Number one, almost every worker in a company um, probably with a few small exceptions, are paid less than their marginal product. They would have to be. Otherwise, what's the point of employing them? The firm would make no profits. And out of the wages that they receive, they have to save for the future. So any worker, broadly speaking, has a net disinflationary effect on the economy because you're producing much more than you're consuming. So while the last 30 years saw a decline in dependency ratio, that means workers were outstripping the increase in dependence, the net disinflationary impact was higher than the net inflationary impact. Over the next 30 or 35 years, that is simply going to reverse. And the only way we can stop it is 
what people point to is technology is productivity, but there are limits to that. So I, I want to ask you a couple questions about that. Um, one is when we look at kind of global trends in population, um, we can see that, you know, China, because of the one child policy, its demographics are going to change very, very quickly. But there's other co- economies, particularly in Africa and also in Southeast Asia, that that aren't aging as rapidly, where um, the dependency ratio um, isn't isn't going to change. Why can't one of those economies become the China of the next thirty years? Why why can't the global labor force be you know increased by the integration of a big African economy or Pakistan or you know a, a, a Southeast Asian economy with with growing population? No, it's a it's a very valid question, and you know, India's often had some claim to that. Pakistan is another place that has a population that will get young for very uh, for a much longer time. Sub-Saharan Africa has fantastic demography uh, on its uh, balance sheet, um, and a lot of these countries are going to sustain that story for a while. There are a few problems here. If you go to New Delhi, uh, or you if you look at the Arab Spring. One of the issues that makes policymakers sweat is how to get a young population jobs on a persistent basis. So, in fact, we're looking at two extreme problems. One, on the one hand, we're saying, well, these countries should be a massive boon to the global economy, which is aging, and we should be able to utilize their labor supply very well. And policymakers on the local side are sweating to say, how are we going to get all these young people jobs? You know, as as, as Mark Knopfler says, uh, two men said they are Elvis, one of them must be wrong. Uh, there must be something <laughs> in between. And I think what bridges the gap between the two is that a lot of the economies in Africa uh, or in Southeast Asia don't have the ability to transform capital into output as effectively. So there are three things to keep in mind. Number one, mathematically and economically, the problem would be solved if we could take some of the excess labor that policymakers locally are worried about and bring it over to the West, and we could deploy them according to the human capital of all different parts. Politically, that seems very difficult, especially Mm -hmm. given the debates that we've had. I think Ukraine's um, um, uh, refugee story has been handled in a very, very, very different way for a variety of reasons than any immigration story that we've seen in the last decade. And I don't think that's going to change very soon. So why not then take capital there? You could. But just to give you a flavor of the problems at hand, Africa and India actually have the same size population, you know, close to a few hundred thousand, which is peanuts for places like India. <laughs> the, 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 problem, yeah, the problem is Africa is not a nation, as we know. It's a collection of 50 mm-hmm. countries. And India as a country by itself has so many problems coordinating a national strategy that it's very difficult to think that you'll avoid the wasted replication of infrastructure of basic things in Africa and come with a coordinated strategy which you would need to become the next China. And the last point I'd make is China was incredibly lucky. In the last 30 years that China rose rapidly, globalization was a good word. Everyone wanted to shift offshore. Now we think Africa will do very well. We think India will do very well. They will receive a lot of capital inflows. But the willingness to offshore your production, your supply chains, it's its just not as enthusiastic as it's been. So in fact, if you take the fact that all these countries that have a young population are not really manufacturing superpowers yet, and we're hoping they'll become, the role they have to play is almost that of three Chinas, not one, in order to offset the demographic headwinds that we're seeing. So we're optimistic on them, but we're not very optimistic that they will become the salvation of an aging society. Right. So you're, in some sense, optimistic on their growth profiles, but not on their ability to kind of offset the inflationary forces in kind of more developed economies. Would that, would that be right? I think that's perfectly well said. Yeah, one one thing um, that I got I took from your book was that you know if we look at where the kind of growth in demand for labor is going to be in the kind of developed economies, it's going to be in the healthcare sector, um, and uh, that is much more difficult to automate away. Technology doesn't. You know, of course, we can apply technology, but we're not going to have robots looking after our parents. Um, at least that's what my parents are emphasizing to me, anyway. <laughs> you know, um, 
And and I think what you're saying is, hey, if you could if you could take people from you know Africa and have them work as healthcare workers in the developed economy, that might that might help. But that seems politically really challenging. So the the developed economies are going to have to pay more for people to work in those sectors. Is is that right? I, I think that's spot on again. In fact, I think what we should do is we should get you to paraphrase every answer and I'm going to collect those into a small <laughs> set of and, and, and publish them just so that people get the right message. I think that's absolutely right. But but your parents are uh, either prescient or they have been reading economic articles slyly without telling you because there is a study uh, out of Japan, no less, that confirms what they're talking about. So the Japanese government is far more involved in looking after the older part of the population than any other country, as we all know. And some time ago, um, they had provided nursing homes an incentive for a pilot program in which they gave every nursing home that used a robot a thousand dollars approximately for a certain period of time to find out what that experiment would look like. And a robot was very simple. It wasn't, you know, one of those uh, um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke or any any of those kind of humanitron robots. It was basically simple things that uh, help patients in and out of wheelchairs and onto beds uh, or simple sensors that looked at, uh, you know, whether beds were wet and they needed to be changed, simple things like that. Um, and the study was actually really interesting. The first thing that it did provide was a pretty significant decline in overtime. Because all probably all the nurses who needed to go every night and check four times whether wet, beds were wet or you know anyone needed any help, those sensors obviated the need for that. However, not a single nursing home in the study was able to reduce the number of nurses that they they had uh, on their payroll. There was no decline in unemployment, and there are two reasons for that. Number one, I mean, these machines don't have empathy. Anyone who's in a nursing home, particularly for a neurodegenerative disease, which uh, unfortunately both Charles and I have firsthand experience about, what they want is empathy. And if you can't provide that to them, uh, that kind of service is no good. The second thing is what those machines did allow was for the human staff to focus a lot more on improving the quality of service uh, that that you provided the elderly or whoever was infirmed uh, in those institutions, but it did not really replace human beings at all. And I think that's what the future holds for us. Yeah. Well, there was that movie where um, the guy falls in love with uh, a robot with the vo- voice of uh, Scarlett Johansson. Um, so I think if, you know, if that could be rolled out more aggressively, <laughs> that, might, <laughs> that might help. Um, <laughs> So that that's a point I think that you you make in the book that I, I wanted to highlight because we're I, I think we're all kind of a little bit scared of automation and you really say hey actually we need all the automation we can get and I think what you just said is a really good example sure automation can help with routine jobs and that's good and that leaves the humans to focus on the kind of I don't know higher I don't want to say higher value added uh, that sounds like an a way an economist would approach it but you know like empathy things that humans are 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 capable of doing that robots aren't could you elaborate a little bit more on that this notion that actually automation is is going to be something that's that we're going to want to lean into. Oh, with pleasure. So, so let's start in a slightly different place, right? Let, let's start with the UN population statistics, right? It sounds incredibly boring, but there's a very, the very important point to this. Most of the charts that you'll see almost anywhere, including our book, are based on these human uh, or UN population statistics, right? They tell you how demography is going to change under different tendencies. We take the central one and they are those statistics that show you how compelling the aging in our societies is going to be. However, what they do not do is explain the economic lower availability of labor the way we think about it, okay? Let's think about a worker who has two tasks or two workers who have a choice of things to do. There's a worker who is involved in a manufacturing sector, and there is a worker who is involved primarily in looking after the elderly. Let's call it the most basic functions, not very high value added, if you <laughs> if you wanted to use that phrase and feel free to do so. The, the, the worker who is part of the manufacturing sector is actually part of the production of a capital good, right? Which, which would mean a good that is used to produce other goods, or he could be used 
to produce a good that is going to be consumed and paid for. And the people who are paying for that good could either have incomes that have been earned in the past or incomes that are going to be earned in the future. When you look after the elderly, you cannot produce a capital good. You can only produce a consumption good that has a one-time use. And the reason you say that is because the elderly person is not going to be able to generate an income to pay for it in the future. That service that you provide is going to be very unique, is going to be incredibly idiosyncratic, and it is the reason that healthcare costs in the United States are mistakenly called inefficient. They're not inefficient in a classic sense where we're doing something terribly wrong. And if we just change the way we did things, efficiency would go through the roof. No, the simple point is, if I take two older people to a hospital, the way they need to be treated is completely different. And that difference is something that robots cannot deal with. So I'll give you another cute example from Japan, which always tickles me. (laughs) It's about five years ago or so that Japan, I I, I don't know if you have it in the book, but it's, it's, it's really funny. Japan came out with a fully roboticized hotel. I mean, complete with a velociraptor as a receptionist. Okay, completely roboticized. There was no human working in there. However... Over the next two years, what started happening was that the robots who were trying to give direction to people living in there could not give them simple directions about how to go about different routes to get to the subway station, where they could buy a sandwich. Things like that became very difficult. So in two years... And and, and I must say, most concierge at hotels can't do that very well (laughs) either. (laughs) Yes. They give you the map with the pen and they ink it down. But but, but whatever, whatever the result was... Uh, with no labor unions to protect them, uh, within two years, 50% of the robot staff was fired and have now been replaced by humans. So there is a coexisting middle ground where some right. tasks can be automated, delivery to rooms, so on and so forth. But there are some idiosyncratic human-specific tasks. I don't think it's possible for robots to do them. That may change, but not right, right now. Um, on the, On that topic, as you were talking about automation and technology, I remember that, you know, so if we go back to the basic theme of your book, which is that we've got these uh, structural forces that are going to drive inflation higher, demography, the, the, the one-time China bonus kind of disappearing. What, one of the, I guess, counter arguments to that, and it's not so much an ar- argument against your book specifically, but just the general notion that we're going to see higher inflation relates to technology. And it's the idea that, hey, um, technology in general has lowered costs has put a downward pressure on inflation right the when my first son was born 25 years ago i splurged on a thousand dollar video camera now that same functionality is just a tiny part of my 300 hundred dollar smartphone so that's not going to change technology is going to continue to evolve improve um and therefore you know inflation is going to keep falling because we're going to be able to do things much cheaper What's your response to that? I mean, it's, it sounds like, I mean, I know you've kind of addressed that to some extent, but I want to, since that's an argument we hear, I'd like to just kind of get your general sense for, to the extent, the extent to which that's correct. I mean, I mean, the argument, the way you put it is perfectly sound. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. There are some parts of a consumption basket which are going to get ever cheaper. In fact, uh, I was at a central bank um, I won't name which one because uh, it was a difficult question to ask them. And, and, and I just proposed to someone who was running actually the statistics department. I asked them, look, how, how, do you, how do you assess the contribution of something like WhatsApp to the consumption basket? It started with the price of zero. If anything, its usefulness has increased because of network effects. It's gotten much better. The glitches have gone down and the price has still remained zero. So, you know, it's not even not even as sympathetic sounding as your argument. It's a lot more aggressive. There are services that we just don't pay for that I used to pay a ton for. I mean, just to give you an idea, when I started grad school, it's so far back now that I but I still remember that clearly um, AT&T. Uh, used to come to campuses, and one of the big things that they did for international students, which which I was at that uh, at that time, was they would let to speak to your family for five minutes, and normally that call would have cost you about twenty dollars. 
right? And it, and it was a huge deal. I mean, right now I'm, I'm busy telling my family members, no, I can't speak now. No, I can't speak now. So it, it's, it's a lot more dramatic than that. However, right. the, pr- the problem is not everything that we've got is subject to the same technological progress. Right. And so many, many people might say, look, it's a relative price argument. It's not a absolute price argument. But, you know, there there is an old trade theory um, called Stoper Samuelson and Stoper Samuelson, just to whittle it down, basically says, look, if I hit one part of the economy with a, a positive or a negative shock, what happens is it starts absorbing resources from the other part of the economy until the mm-hmm. whole economy either gets lifted up or lifted down. So it's if the shock is big enough, and this one certainly is, aging will be an absolutely gigantic shock when we think about all the carrying costs that go along with it. That's going to raise the demand for labor in a way that whatever labor is released from sectors that use fewer and fewer people will be absorbed very easily in looking after the elderly. The overall cost of caring is going to go up. And most importantly, Kevin, something we haven't talked about yet is... These are costs that the governments cannot say no thank you to. These are costs that every government that is going to be elected is going to have to incorporate in their debt to GDP ratios. And inflation is the one way that they can make that debt sustainable. Every other way is fraught with some problem or the other. You're talking about inflation is the one way that governments can deal with rising debt. Is that what you're saying? The, the, the... It is. And central banks, too. I mean, you know, in, in a classic uh, economic model, what you would say is the central bank controls the long term rate of inflation. OK, let's say that's true. Then okay. does the central bank have the incentive to allow inflation to be higher? Well, look at the United States. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office's estimates for debt to GDP, Debt to GDP is going to go like a straight line up from the pandemic to nearly 40 to 50 percent higher in terms of debt to GDP over the next 20, 30, 40 years. By the time we get to the the year 2050, U.S. debt to GDP, according to their projections, not ours, is going to be around 200 percent. So this debt around the pandemic that we're talking about is, is a drop in the ocean compared to what aging is going to bring to us. Now, how do we deal with it? Well, if, you, if you're ever stuck on an exam in economics, the one answer you give is productivity and you're always going to get at least half the points, right? <laughs> I mean, Take so, note of that, anyone out there who's <laughs> studying economics. That's right. So that's what we've devoted a lot of this conversation to, what will technology do to productivity and so on and so forth. Right. But, but barring a miraculous increase in productivity, let's say the best case scenario is we hit a Japan kind of number. Japan has outstripped every economy in terms of output per worker over the last 20 or 30 years. Let's say we hit that, 2%. What happens is growth slows down because of demography, because you've got fewer workers. So the net effect of growth and productivity isn't actually tremendous, okay? You could increase taxes, incredibly unpopular, and that's what topples governments. You could try and aggressively fight inflation, but with debt levels rising, we are under a concept of financial dominance, which means financial markets can disrupt it. So inflation then turns out to be the one thing that central banks and governments and societies will need to agree on because how else do you make debt sustainable while the debt to GDP is rising so quickly? How do you convince people that the government is going to generate enough revenues to pay back that debt? If you don't, then the default risk rises and interest rates are gonna go through the moon. Yeah, let, let's talk about that because as, as you were giving that explanation and, and I, I, I'm a complete believer in that and I think the historical record also shows that, right? There's very few episodes where economies grow their way out of debt. Um, it's either, it's usually some combination of, you know, taxation, but more like inflation and, and financial repression, basically enforcing people to invest their money at, at rates below the rate of inflation. So, it sounds like what you're suggesting is that interest rates, um, well, in, in the book you talk about the yield curve is going to steepen a lot. Um, and I, I, found, I found that really interesting because if we look at where the yield curve sits now, uh, 
it's pretty flat, right? Certainly from the difference between say a two-year interest rate and a 10-year interest rate is almost zero. Um, now there's a bigger difference between a long-term interest rate and the current short rate, but if the Fed follows through on what it says it's gonna do and raises rates to you know what the market expects around 3% by the end of the year, then we're looking at a flat yield curve across the board. You were saying that long term, we're going to see a much steeper yield curve. So I'm guessing that you're thinking, hey, um, long rates are going to have to potentially go up by by quite a bit. It, is that right? And again, well, you're not making a prediction about next year or the year after, but if we're sitting here, um, you know, five, 10 years down the road. Well, let, let's talk about the current juncture and, and where we've been wrong, because the curves are in, incredibly flat. So actually, we turned out to be wrong for really interesting reasons. Our argument, in, our argument in the book was what would happen initially is that the central banks would say, and this was actually in the postscript and written very clearly, and we wrote a few articles on VoxCU about this. Our argument was that central banks would say initially, this is all temporary. It's not going to go away. Then they would switch to saying, even that, if it that remains- infl inflation was temporary. Yes, inflation was temporary. And they use the word transitory instead of temporary. The second thing they would then say is, well, even if inflation has gone up, inflation expectations are anchored. And it would be quite a while until they actually came to realize, well, this thing isn't a short-term blip. It's a longer one. What we didn't get and what we didn't take into account, and that's where we got the short-term story wrong on the yield curve, was that markets would not believe them. We have not seen markets treating the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the RICS Bank, as if they were emerging markets, to be honest with you. Uh, in September, when the Federal Reserve indicated that, well, it would have to accelerate quantitative easing at a more rapid pace in the past, the trigger that something had changed led one-year one year yields to go up so fast that it was almost in disbelief that markets saw Federal Reserve not capitulate to rising inflation until December. The same thing happened in Sweden, Australia, Canada, uh, UK, Euro area, wherever you looked, it was as if the market said, well, you are falling behind the curve every day that you don't hike interest rates. And if you can't change things, I will. So the difference that you're talking about is between so J James Carville is is back, right? The uh, the bond market vigilantes, at least, <laughs> uh, you know, are kind of starting to kind of reemerge from their slumber. Is that what you're saying? They they are, but it wasn't just the bond market because usually what would happen is the yield curve would play the the role of uh, being a vigilante, right? What mm -hmm. we're saying over here is it, it didn't even have to come to that. The reason that I said they were being treated like emerging markets is because the one-year and two-year yields went up. That was a direct challenge to central banks saying, you may control the two-year rate, but you don't know what you're doing. And that mm -hmm. was something <laughs> that we have seen only for places like Brazil, uh, for South Africa, for Turkey, and sometimes for India and Indonesia. But being applied to the advanced economies is something we have never seen before to this extent. That's what changed really. That's a fascinating way to put it, um, suggesting that the market has maybe lost faith in central banks more quickly than one might expect. Does that change your conclusion in the book that the yield curve eventually is going to steepen? I mean, we, we, we think there is an opportunity here for the yield curve to steepen, but it will depend tremendously on what central banks do. If mm -hmm. we think if we go back to original thinking, and honestly, we've had no reason to change it, um, that central banks finally understand that they have to learn to live with inflation the way we've learned to live with COVID. The parallels right. are there. Um, that unlike COVID, which you know is, is perhaps some might argue it's a net positive because it gives us immunity, but inflation is actually a net positive. Having inflation 1%, 2%, 2.5%, 3% maybe, well, let's stop there, higher than your okay. target, is something right. that can help erode the real burden of debt over a period of time. And if you had to choose between slightly higher inflation and attacking inflation, which would crush growth, I think most central banks would eventually come to holding policy relatively steady. And under those conditions, you would need a premium out of the bond market. And that's where we think the story might still have some uh, relevance.
But let me, I just want to circle back so that's, that's quite important. So when you said, hey, central banks have to learn to live with inflation, my first thought was, well, markets aren't might not like that, right? So therefore, they're going to impose, central banks can live with inflation in the sense that they can keep short-term interest rates below inflation. But if the markets are controlling long-term interest rates, then we're back to your world where the yield curve does steepen. Is that is that what you're saying? It's a fair point, but I don't want to overextend that point either okay. because I think there is a way that gets around this story. So if you look in the last two years uh, of the recovery, they have been somewhat unique in a very clear sense. So for, for people who are listening over there who are not technical, um, I'm, I'm going to spend a minute just explaining a, a couple of Absolutely. terms, right? So we've, we've got the bonds that the government sells. Uh, markets call them nominal bonds. And the reason they call them nominal bonds is because there are also there is also another kind of bond that is sold which protects you from inflation. The coupon payments are linked to CPI. Uh, and the difference between the two is what markets, the, the yields of the two bonds is what markets call break-even inflation. So markets see that as a way of expressing the inflation um, expectations, as a way of protecting themselves from inflation. What's been unique in this recovery is this is the first recovery we've seen, at least in the data, where break-even inflation, the inflation that the market expects, has been higher than the yield on the nominal bond. Think about what that's saying in some senses. You mentioned repression in the beginning. This is repression in right. a fantastic form. The interest rate on a bond, all-inclusive, does not compensate you for the inflation that the market expects. And to a large extent, that has happened because QE um, and financial repression on bonds, what, what you're required to buy in terms of financial securities, has plowed funds into the bond market and kept nominal yields from rising. If that policy were to be deployed, and I see no way out of it, central bank balance sheets would double, triple, maybe even quadruple over the next 20 or 30 years. And that might be a way in which you can repress economies at both ends, at the short end and at the long end of the yield curve. But that's fascinating because central banks right now are talking about the opposite. They're talking about, you know, getting out of um, QE, quantitative tightening. And you're saying, well, be on the lookout. We might see the other. The other. Is, that, is that what you're saying? Or you're saying if that happened? Oh, no, it is exactly what I'm saying. There is no, I mean, let me put it as bluntly as possible, right? The U.S. government is going to be the biggest issuer of bonds in the U.S. market and in the global market for the next 30 years. There's no doubt about that, unless the CBO's projections are way off target and they're a very responsible institution. It's, mm -hmm. it's unlikely that they are. So let's just take that as something that is a very high probability case. If the central bank reduces its balance sheet, if the Federal Reserve reduces its balance sheet while the issuance and supply of those bonds is increasing, the gap has to be absorbed by the private sector. There is no chance that the debt to GDP in the US rises to 200%, the central bank's balance sheet remains where it is, and the rest is absorbed by the private sector with no effect on interest rates. If we leave it to that, interest rates will go through the roof and crush the global economy, just the US. The Federal Reserve is going to have to increase its balance sheet in a way that keeps the gap between issuance and purchases reasonable so that the private sector can actually absorb that supply. There's no way out. So we've got one of two choices. The first choice, which you think is unlikely, is the central bank does not buy the bonds that the government, US government issues, in which case we get much higher interest rates. We get the steep yield curve that you're talking about in the book. The other choice is that the Fed restarts quantitative easing, absorbs that, and that to me suggests much higher inflation, right? Potentially a loss of faith in the dollar, or you know, do we just muddle along kind of in the same way that we have post-2008 where the central bank balance sheet increased a lot? Well, things have changed a little bit in the following sense that what we, we've got a lot more data um, that tells us things could go one of two ways, right? So Olivier Blanchard, who is probably one of the finest economists in the world, um, had a comment on monetization, 
which doesn't really let you sleep better at night. But I think I think he had it about right, which which he says, look, we've seen plenty of episodes thus far of monetization of debt that have not led to inflation. It may happen that we may overstep the bounds and that some of that monetization comes back to bite us. But in my personal opinion, um, there are episodes in which you don't get massive amounts of inflation um, because of um, debt being purchased by central banks. And the first one is the, the, the bad case. And the bad case is where the debt creates so much excess capacity that it creates disinflation or deflation of its own. We've seen that in China. Right. And then if you're absorbing that debt, all you're doing is really helping write down the value of those assets. That's gotcha. not very good, right? The right. second thing is, if you are um, financing an activity, which if not finance, would have taken inflation through the roof itself. So if if you did not... G- give, give us an example of that. I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, you know, we, we've got it right in front of us. And the simple example is aging, right? So aging will have to be financed one way or the other. If let's say the government says, I'm not touching this, this is all you. You decide how to deal with your own uh, uh, life a little later on. What would happen right now is if the government told us, I've got absolutely no health protection for you or no pension protection for you, you'd stop consuming almost everything you could. Right. Right. Because you'd have to save because you say, well, look, I don't know if I'm going to live to be 70, 80, 90 or 100. You know, there was a very famous book, a very popular book in Japan called The Hundred Year Life. Uh, which really made people wake up to the fact that, look, how are you going to live if you're going to turn out to be 100? What should you do now? If the government told you I'm walking away, you would increase your savings so much that consumption would absolutely collapse as the paradox of thrift and we would go into a deep depression. You'd buy nothing. You just stay home where you are. So the government will not allow that. They can walk away to some extent, but they will finance it. They will take some of it because the government can do the one thing that you can't. They can tax. Right. Right. Now, the question is, is taxation the right way to finance its debt? It's, it's a point we've talked about before, so I won't elaborate much on it. If you tax people, um, then what the worker will say was, well, you're taxing me to pay for the older people. I need to protect my purchasing power. So increase my wages to the extent that I am protected uh, in my after-tax income. And that would be massively inflationary. You can see how a wage right. price spiral yep. might arise. Absolutely. So the central bank then has to say, well... Okay, let's do some of that, but not so much that we get a wage price spiral because that crushes inflation. You spend on the old. I'll buy some of those bonds to help you finance it. And in effect, what I will do is I will not let those bonds expire. I'll just keep buying them. In other words, what the central bank does is it turns a nominal bond with a redemption date into something that we would call a console, a bond that never really expires. Right. It's, it's, it's an infinitely bond, uh, live bond. If the central bank didn't do that, we would have a massive inflation problem on our hands. But the fact that the central bank allows that kind of spending is something that might keep inflation under greater control through monetization, which is a very, very weird concept. <laughs> yeah, that's, but we don't live in a normal spinning world. spinning a little bit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, I'm going to have to go back and think about that one. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating perspective, the idea that... Um, you know, monetization could actually be disinflationary in a, in a, in a certain world. And I guess, um, you know, is, is Japan an example of that? Because they have done, you know, they have monetized their, their debt. And I, I know that in the book you say, hey, actually Japan is not really a good template for what we're going to experience. But in that limited sense of the of the government, you know, basically monetizing the debt um, and inflation not taking off, is, is that an example or is that not the right analogy to make? I think partly yes, partly yes, because they have financed uh, a lot of government spending. Um, but the, the reason it's a yes and no answer is because not all of the government spending has been productive. I mean, really, when right. we started looking into Japan is when I realized that the phrase that is used so often for China bridges to nowhere actually came from Japan. Right. They, they'd spent a lot of money on infrastructure um, and it simply wasn't used to the same extent that they thought it would be. So some of Japan's um, debt has been spent on things that you really can't understand. Without naming any names, I'll tell you that I spoke to a, 
um, Japanese economist who I used to work with. And I had a simple question for him. I said, over the last 30 years, can you tell me where Japanese fiscal spending has gone? And he came back to me with a phone call that said, I can't because no one knows. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of shocking, really. <laughs> but, but, but you see where, where we're going with this is in the future. And now Japan's spending on the elderly is quite significant. And to the extent that the government has allowed that spending to happen, we haven't gone into a depression and we right. haven't gone into extremes. So there is some of what you say in that story. I don't quite know if my thesis is going to work out, but I just don't see any way out of it for most central banks. They'll have to finance some of the fiscal spending. We're getting toward the end, and I, I, I wanted to bring up um, inequality a little bit because that's in the title of your book. Um, and in some sense, the message, I guess, is positive in that you are suggesting that inequality is going to wane. And could you elaborate a little bit on why you think that's the case? Oh, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to. I mean, the simplest message that comes out of our book is that the bargaining power of labor is set to come back. Right. Um, and And it's so easy to see today. That point was really hard to make two years ago because when the pandemic hit, the real discussion around the pandemic was whether there would be um, wage growth uh, or according to the opposite camp, whether there would be what people call scarring, right? And, and scarring meant that labor markets would take an incredibly long time to recover and wage growth would be non-existent for the next five years, maybe even more depending on the pandemic. That simply hasn't panned out. And what we've seen is not only has um, labor in an absolute sense been scarce, uh, which means that the lower availability of labor has caused wages to grow, but we've seen two distributional stories that are absolutely fascinating, right? If you look at the Atlanta Fed's uh, wage tracker. The Atlanta Fed's wage tracker tells you that the lowest income and skill quartile of the labor market, which is where most of the labor deficiencies in terms of supply have been, is growing at two to three times the pace of wages in the top earning quartile. Right. It, so, it's fascinating that that you say that. I, you know, to throw in a, a real world example, my son works at. Um, at a resort in central Oregon. And, um, you know, they, they just can't find anyone to, you know, clean the houses. And so they've had to increase wages, increase wages, increase wages. And so they did eventually, you know, start to attract some of the local people to do the cleaning. Um, but they had had to raise the wages so much that the cleaners, when you kind of aggregated their wages on an annual basis, were making more than the managers, at the resort and the managers, when they kind of did the math, like, hold on, you know, I, you know, I should get paid more, whether they should or not is another story, but yeah. then they bargain, their wages go up. Um, and you get, you know, I, I think that's an example of what, of what you're saying. Oh, it, it completely is. I mean, I see the same thing happening um, um, uh, in, in the UK. And I'll get to another example that will add to your anecdotal story, but look at what you're implying, right? Effectively, it's a microcosm of that Stopa Samuelson story that I told you about, <laughs> right? Which is basically saying that, um, you know, one segment of the labor force gets a shock, wages go up over there, and another segment says, well, hold on a second, if that's so attractive, I'm going to give up being a manager and start taking lower order jobs. And eventually that pressure pushes up all wages. And naturally, we've got to keep in mind that all of this is happening while the hotel, I'm presuming, is struggling to keep a full supply of rooms and services intact. Absolutely. Which means, which means for a lower supply, you've got a higher input cost, which is where the wage price spiral comes from. But there's one more anecdotal story, if you don't mind, okay. I'll talk Absolutely. about. And, and, and that actually is best to show through what's happening at a place uh, like the one my wife works at. Um, so she is a uh, distributional manager uh, for online services at a, uh, a local a chain of retail stores and they have struggled to keep good workers with them because the compensation that are being offered exactly in places that your son is working in restaurants and hotel has gone up so much that leaving a job where you've got three years experience uh, and wages that reflect that 
is far easier because the starting wage for completely inexperienced workers is sometimes higher. And so what you see in the United States and in other places is people are saying, okay, this sector looks really difficult from a long-term perspective. And I want to switch to something else that's better. And luckily, the wage is so good that by switching and giving up seniority in the place I was working, I actually lose nothing and maybe I stand to gain right now. And so a reallocation of labor hmm. between sectors has never been easier. And that's what we will see in the demographic future as well. That's fascinating. Um, so that, I guess, is the the positive story in the, from the inequality sense, right? You're saying your wages are going to go up at the um, at the lower end. Um, I suppose the the, the negative uh, at the macro economy sense is that it means higher higher inflation, right? Or or at least that's uh, maybe you wouldn't describe it as negative, but it's a it's a contributing force to higher inflation. Well, it is negative in the sense in the se- it, that it destroys our notion that our inflationary future is in our hands. And it is sure. safe in the hand of central bankers, right? You know, and right. back in the day when I was teaching at university, I, I used to um, try and depict Greenspan as being portrayed almost like Luke Skywalker. And then <laughs> and I, was, I, was, I was horrified when uh, The Economist came up with the same idea <laughs> and showed him. You hadn't uh, copyrighted it, I guess. No, no, I was, I was, it, it was terrible. But, you know, it, it, was, it was the way people were thinking. And that idea has been really blown to smithereens to some extent. And that makes us feel unsafe. And when we feel unsafe, financial markets demand a risk premium for the most basic activities, and that makes everything harder. So it is a win-win situation. If inflation is falling, growth is better. It's what Mervyn King called the nice years, Mm non-inflationary continuous expansion. The problem is the social side is where we gave up a lot of the benefits, right? We we had unhappy societies, which we are paying the price for even today. So the the, the trade-off in the future is that we, we, we get some of that back. We, we feel we are more equal over a period of time. The people who have been neglected, the workers that we simply didn't have to worry about, are the ones who are on our radar in a big way. But we give up some of the macro stability and the ease of doing things, the ease of access to credit, the low risk premiums that we had in the past. I mean, you know, some would say it's, a, it's, it's, it's not a good trade-off. Some would say it's an excellent trade-off. And that's the world we're in. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think that's a that's a really good place to start on a, or stop on a um, maybe a, a more positive note or certainly a note that hey the world the world's changing it it might seem a little scary but it's certainly you know potentially manageable and I just wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to come and talk to us it's a it's a book that we've really only scratched the surface of we wanted to talk more about Japan um, and there's there's a lot. Um, there's a lot in the book about that, so I really would suggest anyone who's heard this conversation to to pick it up and 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 read it. So, Manoj, thanks for thanks for joining us, and uh, I wish you uh, all the best. Uh, Kevin, I really enjoyed that. I'm looking at the the, the recording time, and it's 56 minutes. It's uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's time's really flown by. Thanks for having <laughs> me. That was great. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin and Manoj, for a very insightful conversation. Clearly, the nice years, meaning the non-inflationary continuous expansion years, are over, and demographics will drive so much of the global economic agenda for years to come. The consequences of QE or non-QE that Manoush expects are massive, and it'll be interesting to see if central banks and policymakers will choose inflation or higher interest rates as their worst enemy, and the risk of getting both is, of course, pretty high as well. Aging will have to be financed for sure, which will make life very difficult indeed. Uh, And that forecast of the US government being the biggest issue of bonds bar none in the coming decades will potentially lay the ground for massive dislocations in the financial markets, which investors need to be prepared for. Make sure you go and follow Manoush and Kevin's work, as well as getting a copy of both of their books, because as you can tell from today's conversation, some of these ideas and topics are not being discussed on mainstream media. From Kevin and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other.
Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.